Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm glad we have some people in the audience. This special edition of Frontiers in Medicine is being broadcast from the Anschutz Medical Campus. Yay. So on behalf of Colorado AHEC or the Area Health Education Center and the Anschutz Medical Campus, I would like to welcome everybody who is uh, attending remotely, as well as the people that we have here in the auditorium to, to tonight's Minimed Frontier Edition. Today's session Zoonoses, not a good day at the petting zoo. We're very proud and super honored to feature Dr. Mark Deutschman, MD. So he is a professor in the Department of Family Medicine at, here at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. He also has faculty appointments in the School of Dental Medicine and in the School of Public Health. Wow. He has been involved in rural medical practice or teaching for over 45 years. He started when he was five. He practiced family medicine in rural Washington State for 12 years after completing medical school at the Ohio State University in residency in Spokane, Washington. After leaving rural practice, he taught at the University of Tennessee, Memphis, and developed an, an obstetrics fellowship for family physicians destined for rural practice there. He's been here at the University of Colorado since 1995, teaching medical students, residents, and fellows, and developed an obstetric fellowship and a rural fellowship. That's when I met him. I proudly claim that I'm his first rural tracker. He got a hold of me the summer before I started medical school and asked me, what do you think about this? And I came on board. Do you remember that? Um, he has been a very important mentor to me ever since then. He's, he is still my official mentor here at the School of Medicine. Um, where was I? Da, 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 da. Founded the Rural Track. In 2005, he founded the Rural Track in the School of Medicine, a program for students who are planning a career in rural medical practice. He is Associate Dean for Rural Health at the University of Colorado and has served as the in the, in the past as this director, the director of Colorado AHIC, right before me. His research and development efforts focus on rural health care, workforce development, access to maternity care, and interprofessional collaboration. Please welcome with me Dr. Mark Deutschman. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to see the people whom I can see and say hello to the people out there in, uh, in Zoom land. Um, this is a topic that is actually kind of interesting. Um, I hope you will find it interesting. Um, as uh, Dr. O'Connell um, mentioned, um, I run the rural program in the CU School of Medicine, and we try to cover some things in a little bit more depth, uh, certain things that might be covered in the School of Medicine for students that aren't interested in rural. Um, and this happens to be one of them. Um, uh, so we all uh, encounter animals in our life, but in rural areas, you may encounter a few more animals than you do in, in the city. So we'll cover some of those things. So uh, let's start out with a definition. Um, the definition by the World Health Organization is that zoonoses are diseases and infections which are naturally transmitted between vertebrate animals, that's animals with a backbone, and humans. And we're going to cover about eight zoonoses that are important, especially several that are important in Colorado um, in this uh, session this evening. But if you look on the World Health Organization's website, you'll find a three and a half page list in small font of, of um, infections that fall into this category. And some of them, of course, are in, in just limited places on Earth. But this whole thing about uh, infections transmitting from the animal world into the human world is actually a, a pretty important uh, study. And you probably remember that COVID-19 is exactly one of those that is thought to have originated uh, in an animal and then transmitted to humans. And in fact, if you look at the infections that we're worried about in, in the future, 75% um, of those are actually things that we see in the animal world that we're concerned about getting into the human uh, population. Um, 
And um, in infectious diseases uh, in humans, many uh, can be spread from animals. So who's at risk? Well, as you imagine, it's the very young, the older people. I don't consider 65 to be that old. Okay, good. Several people here, we voted. How many people think 65 is old? Not even the young people have said that, so thank you. Um, anyway, uh, pregnant people. Uh, and then, as you might imagine, people whose immune systems are not working very well. And then um, also those who work with animals a lot. You know, the more you work with animals, the more you be, may be exposed. <clears throat> so in general, there, there are several modes of transmission. Number one, you can have direct contact with saliva, with blood, with urine, with other body fluids. Um, that would be a way for humans to contact um, animal um, uh, infections. Then you can have indirect contact where some sort of an animal fluid got on an object um, and then you touched it and you got in contact with it. There are also infections that there's an inter intermediary like a tick. So the tick bites an animal that has an infection, then the tick bites you, and then you get it by the tick. Um, food is a way that we get um, some of these infections and water also. So our food, our water, um, even the air we breathe, these are all ways that you can get um, um, in, uh, contacted with, um, with animal infections that could affect humans. And um, the, the preventive methods are what you'd figure. Guess what? Wash your hands. How many times have we heard that? Um, and then wearing masks or an eye protection if you're going to be around aerosols or sneezes or coughs or whatever. Um, for the foodborne ones, cooking usually destroys most of the problems that you would get. That's why we don't like to eat, uh, drink raw milk or um, eat foods that were prepared in an unsanitary way. Um, and then we can also find out about these things by doing periodic testing of animals. And often farm animals are do undergo surveillance for certain infections, and then they can be called out or disposed of uh, so they don't infect the rest of the, um, the herd. Um, we also can use disinfectants. That, of course, goes along with hand washing. And then uh, managing wildlife. You've probably heard about you know, situations in which deer or elk have been found to be infected, and so they've been called out of the herd. And unfortunately, there are also climate changes and pollutions that can make these things worse. So it's, it's part of the um, climate. And that, that gives rise to this one health concept, which is that humans, animals, and the environment are all linked together. And that's something that's a theme of the uh, of um, Colorado State University with, um, with their One Health program that many of our students participate in. So the ones that we're gonna talk about are listed here. These are the eight zoonoses that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have identified as of most concern. And I'm adding a bonus of Q fever and hantavirus, partly because hantavirus is big in, in the Southwest uh, of the country, like where we are, but um, I'm just gonna throw in some ex for extra credit, right? This is medical school, right? You wanna get extra credit. We're all gunners, okay. Um, so what we're gonna do is basically work our way through these conditions and talk about certain features of each, of each condition. So influenza A is the first one. Um, we all probably are familiar with the fact that it's in poultry. You've heard about birds and all that stuff. Um, the Spanish flu, the Asian flu, the bird flu, the Hong Kong flu. Um, these all were um, uh, thought to be uh, in large part um, transmitted with birds because birds fly all over the place. They fly all over the world. And so they're vectors that take things around, but they can be found in pigs, whales, horses, seals, and cats too. All you cat lovers out there. Okay. Um, and uh, they these viruses are in various types based on their hemagglutinins and their neuramin, neuraminidases. And I'll talk about that in a second for extra credit. But a point about influenza A is that um, animal to human, if you get it from an animal, it's usually not a severe case. The worst 
people to infect you or other people. So if you get it from a human, it's likely to be a more severe illness than if you get it from a bird. So here's the extra, the first extra credit. What the heck are hemagglutinins and neuraminidases? Well, the virus has got to get into a cell. And then once the virus takes over the cell genome to reproduce, it's got to get the virus out of the cell. So hemagglutinins are the things on the virus that enable the virus to break down, break through the cell membrane and get into the cell. So it can inject its um, uh, genome and take over the cell and make it produce more viruses. Then when all those viruses are in the cell, they have to break out of jail. So the neuraminidase is something that the virus produces to get out of the cell and then infect more people or more anythings. Um, so that's what hemagglutinins and neuraminidases are. And influenza A is different from influenza B um, in that humans are the natural host for influenza B, um, but it, it doesn't get people as sick. But when we give vaccines, it includes treatment or prevention for A and B. Um, and a lot of times you can't really tell the difference, but that's just a, a background. And there's also C and D. We're not going to talk about those because those aren't as important for humans. Um, so how do you diagnose influenza A? Well, you can get a test, but guess what? It's not hard. Uh, you know, we all know when we've got the flu. Um, the, it comes on quickly, um, abrupt onset. You get a fever. You get aches and chills. Um, you feel fatigued. Um, and you don't really have as much of a nasal discharge and sore throat as you get with um, the cold. But usually, if it's a really bad cold, it might, might as well be the flu. But if you're an otherwise healthy person, the treatment is just wait it out and get better. But um, there are antiviral medications. They're advertised on TV all the time. Um, and uh, the important thing is, though, that they only really help is if they're started within two days of when you get sick. So um, uh, that's basically what I have to say about influenza A. We're going to go on to the second zoonosis, which is salmonellosis. I think that probably everybody here has heard of salmonella. Um, so um, it's pretty darn common. Um, over a million people a year get it. If people especially are not in you know, the best of health, they can get sick enough to need to be in the hospital if they get dehydrated from vomiting and diarrhea. Um, and some people even die from it. The most common place to get salmonella from these days is from raw chicken, from backyard poultry, pet turtles, and also you can get it from food that you buy if it was contaminated and that would usually be prepackaged meats and salads. And you probably several times a year on the news, you know, you hear about, you know, the salad from fill in the blank or the meat from fill in the blank has been recalled because of salmonella contamination. But there was a source that from peanut butter. Do you remember the hearing about this several years ago? Um, it was a peanut butter plant that didn't have good sanitation. And uh, they actually got prosecuted for that, as, as I remember. <clears throat> but um, we, it's common diarrhea, fever, abdominal pain. Um, it's often very short lived, just a few hours. Um, but um, uh, it can last for about a week. And it can also um, occur pretty soon after exposure, um, or it can take several days before, uh, between the time a person is exposed and when they get sick. Um, it's generally not treated with antibiotics. It's felt that, you know, it just has to run its course uh, and that maybe taking antibiotics will actually prolong the, the, um, the infection. You can culture it, but it's usually pretty clear when somebody comes in with an acute episode and you know, ask them what they ate, and you can figure it out. And it's prevented, of course, by good hand washing. Um, you know, we all talk about, you know, you handle raw chicken. Uh, the cooking will kill the salmonella, but 
if you don't wash your hands and wash the cutting board and wash the counter off where you've prepared the chicken, you can transfer the bacteria from the preparation area, you know, to the finished food. Uh, and then the cooking, you know, won't have done any good. Um, so we try to bring home a Colorado story. So this was um, uh, uh, a report that came out just about a year, uh, well, a couple of years ago now. Um, and it was linked to seafood. Um, so that wasn't on the list there, but I think you can tell that any any raw food or poorly cooked food that gets contaminated with sal salmonella can be uh, you know, transmitted. Um, the other thing is eggs, uh, because salmonella is a natural uh, uh, presence in the um, uh, chicken's uh, GI and reproductive tract. And when the, the egg comes out the same place in a chicken that the other stuff comes out. <laughs> and so uh, fresh eggs can be contaminated with salmonella. So we have to be concerned about that. The other thing, of course, is the is the um, the popular thing about now about raising your own chickens, your own backyard chickens. So guess what? They probably have salmonella naturally. So you have to be careful about your backyard chicken. Just because they're your backyard chickens doesn't mean they can't poison you. Okay. All right. So we've covered influenza A and we've covered salmonella. We're going to go on to another thing that is actually important in the U.S. and especially in our area where we live, and that's West Nile. Uh, so West Nile virus uh, is carried by birds. And remember, birds fly all over the place. They come from Canada down through here, and then they go to the southern, southern part of the world, and they fly back. And um, mosquitoes bite birds, and then the mosquitoes can bite us. So if you end up getting bit, bit, bitten, I don't know, bitten by the wrong mosquito, you can get West Nile. It is seasonal. Um, and most people who get it, they might feel a little sick, but they don't get all that sick. But there are some people that get very serious illness, especially if it affects their central nervous system. They can get encephalitis and meningitis, which is very severe. Um, but usually people just feel a little bit sick. They may get a fever, rash, vomiting, diarrhea, fatigue, but the fatigue can last for quite some time. And the way that we prevent this is by using insect repellent. And if you're out hiking, wearing long sleeves with you know, something to keep the wrist shut and then wearing longer pants with something to keep the, the um, cuff uh, shut. Um, because this is a public health issue, because of the mosquito transmission, it is something that the public health departments really want to know about. So um, whenever there is a suspected outbreak of West Nile virus, the health departments usually get involved and start doing sur some surveillance to try to figure out, you know, um, how extensive it is and provide people with extra precautions. So unfortunately, there is no specific treatment and it's basically supportive, um, drinking fluids and then taking anti-inflammatory agents like non-steroidals to help with the achiness and stuff like that. And so here comes a Colorado story. So this was in Delta County out on the Western Slope, the, the next county to, to um, Grand Junction, to um, Mesa County. Um, this was two summers ago um, and it turned out that the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta actually labeled this county as a hotspot for West Nile virus. It was the highest incidence per capita in the entire United States. And one of the things in, in an article um, was that unfortunately, Delta County had no mosquito control plan that covered the whole county. So they had pockets where there were a lot of mosquitoes. And uh, it's just an example of how public health measures, guess what, they're important. <laughs> um, so Delta County had 16 cases and one death. So it, less than 1% of the population had 14% of the cases. So 14, it had 14 times the incidence of West Nile virus. 
Um, and the little picture there is just somebody spraying for mosquitoes. So that's all I have to say about West Nile virus. Wear your, wear your um, long pants, wear your long sleeves, and put on insect repellent. Pretty good. All right. The next thing we're going to talk about is dun, 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 the plague. Okay, the plague. So um, the plague, as you probably know, there were several horrible epidemics of the plague um, in Europe. In the 14th century, they called it bubonic plague or black death. And I'll tell you why in a second. They killed more than a third of Europe's population. And um, the manifestations of plague are really bad. We'll show you some pictures in a minute. Um, but there have also been outbreaks in California, recently in Mongolia, and it's endemic in several places in the, in the world. And if you look at those red dots on the map, um, the Four Corners area where we live uh, is actually an endemic plague area. So plague is out there. Um, looking back in history, there were people called plague doctors. And um, you can read this. A plague doctor wore a black hat, beaked white mask, which contained aromatic substances to block out the smell of decaying bodies, and a waxed gown. The rod or pointer kept afflicted patients away. Of course, this was the first hazmat suit, right? Okay. Um, so plague is caused by an organism called Yersinia pestis. Um, and it is housed in fleas that have bitten an infected rodent. So this is another thing that comes to us by a vector. So the flea is the vector, the rodent's the problem, the flea bites the rodent, then bites us and transmit it. Um, also, if you handle an infected rodent, you could be exposed to it. I, I see there's not much enthusiasm for handling infected rodents, okay. <laughs> Um, and it is definitely a problem that occurs in the United States, especially in the area where we live. There are three forms of it, bubonic, which is part of the name, and that comes from swollen lymph nodes that are called buboes. And so you can get a form where you just get a lot of swollen lymph nodes. Then there's a septicemic form, which causes tissue death, a sense the black death, because if tissue dies, it turns black. And then there's a pneumonic or lung form where you basically get a pneumonia of it. And the really important thing for anyone who's taking care of patients, especially in endemic areas, like I showed you before, which include where we live, if you suspect that a person has plague, they need to be treated immediately before any tests are done because it can progress very rapidly and become very difficult to treat, but it is treatable as opposed to West Nile virus, which is, there's no treatment for. There is a treatment for plague, but it has to be initiated uh, right away. So these are some examples. The one on the left is somebody with big swollen groin lymph nodes. That's a bubo. Septicemic um, there um, shows uh, tissue that has died and turned black. And then the x-ray um, there is of a chest x-ray with pneumonia. So I think you can see the pointing. Um, so uh, the black area is where air is in the lungs and the lighter, the, the whiter area down here on the left and on the right is where the lungs are infected and basically wet. And so the x-rays don't go through. So they don't look black, they look white. And the little culprit there up there on the right, that cute little prairie dog, yeah, he, he's the he's potentially the bad guy. Okay, so cute, you said. Not till you see a whole field of them that are bit, digging up your crops. Yeah. Okay, or transmitting plague. Okay, all right. Um, so I, I mentioned the bubonic form from flea bites or broken skin, um, septicemic, um, same way, and... Um, inhaled the, the pneumonic form you can get by inhaling bacteria when you're handling um, infected animals. So if you have a, a dead animal, you know, get a long stick. <laughs> yeah. 
preferably with a shovel on the other end. And I you dig a hole, put it in there. Don't, don't like, you know, don't bring it in the house. Okay, uh, and this is just another picture. The bubonic form is the most common form uh, and it, it produces large swollen uh, lymph, lymph nodes uh, in the areas where lymph nodes are, which are usually under the arms and the groin, et cetera. <clears throat> and the, new, the pneumonic plague is the, you know, the one that's transmitted through the air and that's the most, the most contagious type and um, it can cause death rapidly but there is treatment for it, but it needs to be treated promptly. And then the septicemic, this is a terrible picture of um, somebody who's losing most of their hand uh, from the uh, septicemic form. And the little, you can see this, you can take samples of a lymph node or blood or some, or uh, stuff that people cough up. You look under the microscope and it looks like these, um, these uh, gram negative rods, which means that they stain kind of red. Um, and then they have a, like a, um, a, a blank spot in the middle. So it looks like a safety pin. Does that look like a safety pin to you? Never thought so, okay. And, and then um, this is the take -off. So if there was a test, you're in medical school and they ask you, if you, if you think the person has, has plague, do you start treating or do you wait for test results to confirm it? Okay, good, you passed, okay. My work is done. So there is no, there is no vaccine for, for um, plague. Um, and one way to control it is to decrease the population of rodents and prairie dogs. Um, if you do come across a dead animal, um, wear gloves. Uh, you can use insect repellent to keep the fleas away. Um, and um, don't don't let your outdoor pets sleep with you. Okay, um, <laughs> all right, because your outdoor pets are out there. They're playing with the prairie dogs. Right? Your your dogs chasing the prairie dogs. Don't sleep with your dog. Okay. Uh, well, I don't know that they transmit plague, but I don't recommend sleeping with them either. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So salmonella is the reason to not sleep with your outdoor chickens. P plague is the reason to not sleep with your furry animals. Okay. And um, if there is somebody who came in contact with a person who had the, the, the respiratory form, they can be treated with those antibiotics to help prevent them from getting sick. And this is just to remind you that plague is endemic here. I showed this already. I'm showing it to you again. All right, let's see. Time-wise, I think we're doing okay. Um, all right, the next one we're going to talk about is coronaviruses. And, uh, you know, COVID-19 is the poster child for coronaviruses. I don't think I have to go through these statistics, but coronavirus really doesn't look like this thing with the red things on it. This is an electron, electron microscope picture. That's what it really looks like. And this is an artist's rendition. But anyway, um, it shows the, the, the structure of the, of the thing. And COVID-19 was a new form, but there were other forms of this previously. In 2003, we had the SARS epidemic that started in China. And then um, in 2012, we had the MERS. So these things are evolving and they'll probably come back in some form uh, in the future. So again, um, you probably know from personal experience that COVID-19 can have a variable presence. Some people don't even know they had it. Some people simply think they had a cold. Um, some people get the classic signs, the loss of taste and smell. Some people develop blood clots. Um, and some people get severe respiratory failure and die. So it really is a broad spectrum. Not everybody who gets COVID gets sick in the same way. Um, and again, hand washing, staying away from the sick individuals, wearing masks and getting vaccinations are the important thing. And fortunately, we do have treatment. We've got antiviral drugs and monoclonal antibodies that can be used depending on the guidelines that are present for whatever form or variant is, is present at the time. 
Um, and then um, something that, again, this is a Colorado story from Colorado Public Radio, estimating that 300,000 people in Colorado who've had COVID are suffering from some long-term effects, the, the, um, the, the long COVID syndrome. And, and this is something that is relatively new that, you know, we usually think of an infection as coming and going, but this is one that seems to be associated with a prolonged um, uh, symptom, uh, symptoms. So we covered that. What are we gonna talk about next? Rabies, okay. So um, rabies is a problem mostly in wild animals and it's only found in mammals and bats are mammals. Remember that? Okay. Um, and it's generally spread through bites and scratches. And in the US, bats are the most common uh, animal that it's associated with. And um, the, you don't need much of a bat bite or scratch. Sometimes they can be unnoticed. So if a bat gets down your chimney into your house, um, don't try to grab it. Get you a net or something like that or call the exterminator, but stay, stay away from bats. Um, but worldwide, dogs are the most common uh, animal. But in the United States, it's bats. Um, it probably because we have, you know, in this country, we usually, you know, bat, uh, dogs get immunized, stuff like that. And in, in other countries, there may be more feral dogs. Okay. Can you apply feral to a dog as well as a cat? I think so. It just means kind of out there. Okay. And um, the unfortunate thing is that if a person gets rabies, it's almost universally fatal. Uh, when they get the neurologic form of it. So pets need to be vaccinated, but don't sleep with them for the other reasons. Um, and avoid contact with wildlife, especially wildlife that is acting weird. You know, the kids that like to feed the squirrels and the chipmunks, well, throw the food to them. Don't try to have them eat out of your hand. And especially if the animal is behaving strangely um, and there is, I'll show you in another slide, once a person's been exposed, there's a protocol to go through to prevent them from, from getting infected. But people who work with animals, like especially vets, they get, they get vaccinated against it. But it's not something that we all vaccinate ourselves because it's so uncommon. So this is a Colorado Department of Health and Environment flow sheet. We're not gonna go through it, but it basically gives you guidance about what to do if there's um, an animal exposure that you're worried about rabies. And you can always call the health department and um, any medical facility will also be familiar with where to get the information. You may not memorize it because you may come upon this once in every 10 years or less. So the important thing is to know where to find the information, not to have the information at hand in your brain because our brains get way too full. Okay, all right, so this is a, I'm not gonna read through this, but there's, um, there's an immunoglobulin, which gives you antibodies against the rabies that might be in your system and clear that out. And then you get the vaccine so that you can build your own immunity. So it's a, a multi-part thing. It's not just a one-shot deal. And to bring it home, guess what? Guess where rabies is present in Colorado? right where we live in the front range. Um, so um, this uh, on the left, uh, the blue one here, the one that's mostly blue was about surveillance. So remember these weren't rabies cases, but they sampled animals and they found rabies in these, in these areas. And then bats uh, were particularly um, found in, in, the, in the same area. Okay, all right. One more. Okay, the next one I'm gonna talk about is brucellosis. Who's heard of brucellosis? Many people, okay. So it's a bacteria um, and it can be, it, we can get it from contact with animals or animal products and raw milk, even though some people are very um, dedicated to it. Um, when we have large, um, dairies and the milk collected all in one place and then distributed. We don't have much that much control over it. And so 
pasteurization is the method that has been developed to make milk safe, not only from brucellosis, but from other things. But if you eat unpasteurized or raw milk or dairy products, there is a risk of transmitting brucellosis. Uh, people who work in meat packing uh, facilities, veterinarians, hunters can also be exposed to it. And people who work in labs and are culturing it and inhaling it can, can get it. Um, and it can be tr transmitted from person to person, mostly through breast milk. So there's a history behind brucellosis. Um, in the early parts of the 20th century, it was really common in cattle um, and it was called undulant fever. Um, maybe if you didn't know the name brucellosis, you may have heard the name undulant fever. Undulants are like cows and elk, things that, you know, they're undulants, they chew their cud and you have all those stomachs, all those cool stomachs and everything. Okay, but in the, in the middle of the last century, there became available a vaccine for it. And it was pretty much eradicated. Um, and now the numbers of animals that are affected by brucellosis are quite low, but there still is, is you know, animals, um, uh, you know, have a value. And so there is, you know, um, say a million dollars in losses, but it's not like whole herds, you know, getting brucellosis and needing to be um, called. So um, in addition to cows, um, goats and sheep um, and uh, uh, cattle, like I said, but dogs, pigs, and recently marine animals, ocean animals have been found to be able to, to carry brucellosis too. So um, it's, it's most likely now that people would find this from uh, wild game from wild hogs, elk, bison, caribou, moose, deer, wolves, and bear. And unfortunately, by looking at an animal, I mean, if an animal looks really sick, I wouldn't shoot it and eat it. <laughs> but even animals that appear healthy can carry brucellosis. Um, and there's really no effective way to tell just by looking at them. Um, when people get brucellosis, they can have a number of symptoms, fever, sweats, feeling bad, kind of like the flu, Seems, it sounds like the flu, headache, muscle aches, fatigue, rash. And then there can also be a chronic form of it where they've had it for a while, they don't seek any help, or they sought help and whoever saw them didn't make the diagnosis. And they go on for longer periods of time having recurrent fevers, joint pains, joint swelling, you can develop heart inflammation and uh, neurologic things. And so this is something that if you're providing health care and you live in the area where we live and somebody's got an illness that's hard to figure out, maybe it's brucellosis. So it can be cultured. Um, and uh, if you're thinking of brucellosis, the lab needs to be careful because the lab people can get it. And it's prevented by having your livestock vaccinated, by cooking foods um, and by using protective uh, covering uh, when you um, handle um, uh, animal products. Okay, treatment, okay. Um, I'm gonna mention Q fever because it's similar to brucellosis. Um, uh, it, uh, it causes a similar, um, you know, uh, syndromes in animals and people. Um, Lyme disease, you've heard about um, a lot on the East Coast. It's a tick-borne illness. Um, and um, it's most common in the summer. Um, and guess what? It's not in our area of the country. <laughs> but we see people who've gone hiking in Maine. And so they come home, they're sick. You got to think about it. Did you, you know, did you pet any animals? Well, maybe it's, you know, brucellosis. Well, but you went hiking in Maine, maybe it's Lyme disease. So this is the life cycle. Um, it's spread by the deer tick um, and uh, rodents or animals do. And it doesn't really have a lot to do with deer. It's rodents again, those little furry guys. Um, and uh, they bite you. And the, the picture up on the, up on the right, is just to remind you, if you're gonna remove a tick, get a pointy tweezers, get it right down near the skin and pull it off. Just don't pull their legs off. Okay, tick removal. And there's a, 
a very telltale rash um, uh, that occurs called erythema migrans. It's a big bullseye thing that is shoot, uh, occurs in the area where a person got bit. So suspect Lyme disease in anybody with these symptoms. Um, and uh, again, if you can't, if you don't have it on your list, you'll miss it. So think about these zoonoses when you're uh, seeing people um, with problems. You can do blood tests uh, to uh, diagnose it. And then the last extra credit one I'm gonna talk about, which was not on the CDC's list is hantavirus. The reason why I'm talking about it is look where it's prevalent. Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, California, and Washington State. It's carried by rodents. These rodents, they, they, they're into everything. And um, that's why if you're cleaning out a barn or a shed and there's mouse droppings, wear a mask, wear a protective covering, stay away from the rodents and their droppings. It causes a flu-like illness. Um, and it has a 38% mortality rate if you get it. Um, there's no vaccine, no specific treatment, but people just need supportive treatment and hopefully they recover. So here are the guidelines, seal up, trap up, clean up. So seal up your, your dwellings so that rodents can't get in, uh, set traps to get rid of them and clean up their messes, but use protection when you clean up their droppings, et cetera. So there are many uh, sources of further learning. Um, Science Direct has a cool thing. The CDC has great information. You just look up zoonoses, CDC. Um, it's uh, And this thing about the eight zoonotic diseases is in this link uh, from the Centers for Disease Control. Audience can hear. So if anybody has any questions, we'll start there. You spoke about people getting the um, rabies vaccine. How long does that last? Um, my, what I know about it is you get the vaccine, but if, for example, a veterinarian gets exposed, they still have to go through some of this extra booster stuff. Is it, you know, like in dogs, you have the one year and you have the three year vaccine. Is that, do, how long does that vaccine last in humans? I'm gonna see if I've got it in my notes because uh, I don't actually know the uh, the answer to that. Um, well, this is too small for me to read now. I can't bring it back up. So um, we're in medical school now. And when a medical student asks me a question that I don't know the answer to, I say, that sounds like a learning issue. Why don't you look it up and report it back to us tomorrow? <laughs> so I would I would Google if I received rabies vaccine and I get bit, what do I need to do? <laughs> um, okay, this is from online. Why is influenza A more severe with human to human transmission than with animal to human transmission? And is this true of most zoonoses? Um, that's a, an interesting question that I also don't know the answer to. Um, I would assume that if the infection from influenza A came from a person to another person, it has somehow be mutated to become more vir virulent. Um, so these viruses are constantly changing and mutating. Um, so uh, it, it, that, that's my answer without uh, knowing a lot of detail. And, and the, I think the second part of that, is that true of all zoonoses? I, I didn't, I, I, I don't know that that is true. I've, I've not heard of that being true. So I know you've um, traveled and worked in other parts of the world. Have you seen or treated all of these? Um, no, I have not treated all of them. I've treated um, or I've seen uh, salmonellosis. I think I've had salmonellosis like many of us had. Um, and uh, I've seen brucellosis. Um, I've seen, I haven't seen rabies, thank goodness. And I haven't seen plague, thank goodness. Um, but um, you know they're they're out there, and I think well, of course I've seen flu and COVID. Um, but um, the main thing is to have people have these things in their consciousness, because if if they're uncommon, you'll miss them unless you think of them. 
And one of the things that we have as a theme in medical school is differential diagnosis. When you see a problem, don't get tunnel vision and say, oh, I've seen that once before and it was X. It can be any number of things. And you have to work your way through what are the signs, what are the symptoms, what are the tests? And sometimes you need a little bit of time to let the disease take its course before you can narrow down. That's why I say, you know, somebody comes in with a fever and a rash. Well, I wouldn't think of brucellosis first, but if they're a rancher, uh, you know, I have to have other kinds of data to help me figure out, um, you know, the next step. If a person contracts West Nile virus, are they then immune to future West Nile infections? The answer is yes. Most people infected with West Nile virus are believed to have lifelong immunity from getting the disease ever again. They're just sick for the rest of their lives. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not a reason to get it. Okay. Okay. All right. You, you don't have a chicken pox party. Okay. Yeah. Do we have any questions from the audience here? Have any of these viruses been linked to cancers or neurological diseases such as ALS or Parkinson's? Um, not that I know of. Several of these infections can have neurologic consequences in and of themselves, especially if they produce meningitis or encephalitis. And remember, anytime you have a headache, you've got, you've got some encephalitis. Your brain is inflamed. Your meninges are inflamed. That's why you have a headache. So neurologic manifestations are common, but I'm not aware of any um, connection with the conditions that, that were asked about. Uh, and then, you know, the other thing is about coronavirus and, uh, you know, long, long COVID. There's all kinds of things, you know, symptoms that people have with that. But as far as I know, it hasn't been specifically linked to uh, those others. With the newer outbreaks of bird flu and cattle, with the virus found in cattle's milk specifically, and the increase with people consuming raw milk, what do you think are the chances of this bird flu causing a pandemic in humans? Anything's possible. <laughs> you know, and the, the, the viruses, as we know, mutate from year to year. Um, there's, a, there's new variants, and usually, the officials look in the Southern hemisphere for what flu is going on to figure out which ones to customize the vaccine for, for us. So it seems to, um, you know, that's the cycle that is done. And, you know, some years they're more virulent than others. And all, all we can do is try to predict, but some sometimes the vaccines are, very um, effective. And sometimes the vaccines are not very effective because the mutations get ahead of them. So um, uh, I think the question was, what are the chances of, of more, you know, uh, influenza A pandemics? Yeah, that's possible. But that's why we try to immunize people and tell people who are sick to stay home. I don't know if I answered that question okay or not, but I tried. <laughs> Are there viruses not pathogenic to humans that we can spread to animals? We probably don't know about them. <laughs> Pardon? Yeah, if you bite the animals. They're not um, I, I don't. I don't know that we'd know about them. If we, are, if we aren't sick with them and they get sick, you know, how would we know? I'm not trying to be a wise guy. I'm, I just don't. I don't think, I don't know how we'd know that. What are the primary characteristics of zoonotic diseases versus non-zoonotic diseases on a biomechanical level as best as you can answer? So she says, basically, I'm wanting to know why some diseases are zoonotic as opposed to other diseases. Mm. Um, well, they're zoonotic because there happens to be something about them that the that the, it occurs in animals so the animals are susceptible to it and we are and so when we contact them we get it but i don't think there's any 
definite characteristics other than that there's something called a reservoir. That's where the virus or bacteria naturally lives and reproduces. Um, and uh, for example, you know, brucellosis, it's, it, it's very common in undulates, especially those that haven't been immunized like you know, deer and elk and stuff. So it lives in them. And um, uh, then, you know, it, then if we get in contact, we can, we can get infected with it. But there isn't anything innate in general about zoonoses. Some of them are viruses, some of them are bacteria. So we get viruses and bacteria too. So I don't, I don't think there's anything special. We had a couple of comments rather than questions here. Um, one of them at UCCS in a microbiology class, I actually presented a paper discussing new innovative ideas for creating a human vaccine for West Nile disease. Oh. They thought that would be a good note for tonight. Yeah, that sounds great. Yay. Thanks, Mike.